OK, in the interest of everyone's time and our speakers time, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, say welcome to the Human Wildlife Conflict uh, webinar on birds of prey. Uh, with us today, we have McKenna Schaefer. She uh, is an educator at the uh, Carolina Raptor Center. Uh, so she's going to be telling us a little bit today about the Raptor Center and the work that they do and ways that we can coexist with wildlife. Um, and more specifically, birds of prey. Uh, so uh, McKenna has been at the Carolina Raptor Center for about two and a half years. So she's gotten all that experience in and uh, really excited to go and show us all that they do and ways to help wildlife. So without uh, further ado, I will turn it over to McKenna. All right, yeah, thank you for having me. We are very excited um, when we were reached out about this project. We have been very, very busy at our rehab side of things um, because it is the season of all the people finding all of the injured animals. So we're uh, very excited to talk about this subject for you guys here today. Um, so I'm going to attempt to share my screen. I did practice before um, this, so hopefully I can do it a pretty smooth transition here. Let's see. All right, so um, can I just have a verbal yes or no if we can see the uh, PowerPoint right now? Yes, we are good and can see you nice and clear. Perfect, wonderful. It's so weird because I can't see any of you guys, um, but that's okay. I'll just talk to myself. Um, so again, I'm McKenna Schaefer. I'm the wildlife educator at Carolina Raptor Center. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who or what Carolina Raptor Center is, um, we are a raptor rehabilitation center, um, but we're also a raptor education facility as well. So originally uh, we started as a rehab center um, in 1975 and our first ever patient was a broad wing hawk um, and it started off in the basement of a university and over the next 40 some years uh, we ended up um, growing into the facility that we are today. Uh, we are very well known for our um, animal training and husbandry skills um, along with our rehabilitation skills. So we're very proud to have a strong front on both the education side and the uh, rehabilitation side. Now our rehabilitation team and our education team and our bird care team all work together uh, towards one common goal and that is conservation. Our ultimate goal is to try and prevent these raptors from coming to the raptor center in the first place. Um, our goal with our rehab center is to release those birds that we get um, into our facility. And we see about 800 to 1,000 raptors a year. Uh, we strictly do raptors. Uh, we don't do any other birds. So it truly is 800 to 1,000 raptors a year. We are located in Huntersville, North Carolina, and so we um, do get a lot of birds from the surrounding Mecklenburg County, but we do get birds from all over the state. We have some amazing transport volunteers uh, that um, allow us to be able to reach out further and further away from Charlotte. If we get a call about an injured raptor, our transport volunteers are all over the state and will bring those injured raptors to us. So we rely heavily on volunteers um, and so we are very, very thankful for those guys. Uh, so I guess I'm going to kind of start um, by going over some of the cases that we have seen over the last um, couple of decades here. So whenever we get a bird in, we uh, write down the cause of the reason that it has come in. And so recently I looked at all of the data and all of the causes just to kind of kind of get an idea and make sure that the conservation messaging that we're doing on the education side is still lining up uh, with the most recent number of cases that we get in. Um, so we'll look at those numbers now. And so last month we had our 24,000th um, patient at our center um, and he was, in my opinion, 
one of our cutest patients. Um, he happened to be a baby barred owl. Um, so it's kind of crazy to think about. We have had 24,000 raptors come through our center um, since we started. And so that's a lot of birds that have come in. So we really are trying to look at what can we do um, to prevent these guys coming in in the first place. So out of those 24,000 cases, um, only 4,171 of them have been because of natural causes. So that's only about 7% of the birds that come into our rehab center are due to natural causes. Um, some of those natural causes are listed below. Um, sometimes um, trees blow down that have nests in them, uh, disease um, like avian pox and Lyme's disease. Um, West Nile is a big one that sometimes comes in. Uh, territory disputes. So the eagle that you see the picture up there, uh, we've been getting a lot of eagles in that have puncture rooms, wounds from talons. Um, and so a lot of um, eagle populations are growing, which is wonderful. Um, but so we are finding more of those eagles are coming in with um, puncture wounds from territory disputes. Uh, fell from a tree. Um, sometimes baby birds aren't the most graceful and they end up falling down. Uh, prey bites. Um, squirrels have a nasty bite and so um, if that raptor doesn't kill their prey right away and the prey fights back, they can actually do some damage. Uh, starvation is a big one. Um, babies that were orphaned and then attacked by predators. Now there's not like a whole lot of um, animals that will attack a raptor, right? Raptors are apex predators. Um, but sometimes a raccoon will try and mess with them if it's desperate. Now, if we look a little bit further into these, um, this is the initial reason that they were brought in. But if we look closer, once the bird is getting examined, um, we actually learn that a lot of these cases were due to human causes. Even though the initial, as soon as the bird comes in, oh, this bird is starving, oh, this bird was considered orphaned. Um, but once we do an actual physical exam, like when you see um, on the screen here, it actually showed us for a lot of the starvation cases, um, they had either toxins or poisons in their system um, from either rodenticides, lead poisoning, um, and things along those lines. So the reason they were starving is because they were sick from chemicals that human put humans put into the environment. Uh, same with the orphans. Um, a lot of times people find um, birds on the ground that are babies and they look helpless. So humans want to help them and bring them into rehab centers. Well, once we do phys physical exams on a lot of our babies, turns out they're pretty healthy and they were doing just fine and they should have been kept with the parents where they belong. Um, so even though the initial cause says those two things, it turns out many of those cases were due to human um, causes. So instead of 7% of cases that are natural, it should be closer to three or four, which totally blew my mind. Um, here are some of the most common type of human causes that we've seen over, um, again, the last couple of decades. Um, birds getting hit by cars, um, entanglements from either fishing line or balloon strings. Believe it or not, we have a lot of birds that come in with gunshot wounds. It is illegal to shoot any raptor species, um, and yet we still see a lot of birds come in with those sort of wounds. Um, nest, nesting tree gets cut down or destroyed, so a lot of times when people are clear cutting, um, they tend to see the nests and the babies after all of the trees are cut down um, because it is illegal to cut down a tree during nesting season when there are eggs and babies in the nest. So a lot of times people don't even notice um, until it's too late. Um, and so we do get a lot of um, birds in that way. Like pull traps. So if someone's trying to trap something else and a desperate raptor wants the bait that's in the trap, they do get caught in those. Um, lately, we've been having a lot of owls that are getting stuck in chimneys, as you can see in the picture. 
Um, chimneys are a great cavity and barred owls are um, cavity nesters. So when they're looking for a place to nest, uh, they see an opening in the chimney and they think that's a good place. Um, but as you can see, not such a great place. Uh, what's lucky with those is all we have to do is give them a bath and they're generally pretty healthy and we can release them um, back where we got them from pretty quickly. And then we do have a lot of raptors that accidentally get trapped in buildings. This is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this was the owl from the picture before after it was or before it was grabbed from the chimney. Um, he definitely looks a little bit confused like how did I end up in this sticky situation? Um, miscellaneous human causes that I found really interesting. Um, glue traps. Glue traps are not a great way um, to take care of rodents. It's both inhumane for the rodents and any other animal that gets stuck in them. Um, the reason rodents die with glue traps is either due to starvation or heart attacks. Um, and then if something else gets stuck in them, like it just isn't a good situation for those animals as well. Um, if these guys are poisoned, even if it's an accidental poisoning, like they're trying to poison the rodents, um, a poison rodent will poison whatever eats it. So again, you poison a rodent and it doesn't die right away. It actually goes out back into the wild. Something else eats it and then those animals get poisoned. Um, we've had birds that have come in from electrocution, power line collisions, building collisions. Um, the next few um, made me not laugh because it is sad, but hit by broom. That was oddly specific, and I found that very interesting to be one of the categories to choose from. Um, hit by roller coaster, and then we've had a handful that have been hit by trains. Um, and unfortunately, some raptors have been stuck in pools and sewages. Uh, for a lot of these, again, I'm very thankful for our transport volunteers that have to go fish out some raptors in a sewage um, system. So thank you um, to all of our wonderful volunteers that help us out. Um, getting these birds to our hospital. Um, so that's a little bit of a background for our um, rehab side of things. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about our education programs um, just because again as a facility as a whole this has been really important to us plus I'm the wildlife educator so I do have to brag about our education programs a little bit. Um, so everything that we do education wise at our center is geared towards connecting people to both the birds but the environment as a whole. Um, that way um, if they didn't have an interest before we're hoping they're going to at least be more aware of what they're putting into the environment um, and we can give them some fresh ideas of things that are super easy to do that they can do to help raptors and other wildlife. So some examples of education programs that we do um, are a um, handful of different things and all of those are geared towards this saying in the end we will conserve only what we love we will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught um, we absolutely love this saying because we do have to connect humans to the environment on on an emotional level to some extent um, we have to get them to care. If they don't care, they're not going to do anything. Um, so we have to find that balance of here are all the cool facts that you can do, but also like here's why you should care. Here's why you should really do it. Um, and then getting that understanding usually leaves the facility in like an upbeat feeling and feeling encouraged that yes, I can do this. I can make a difference, even if it's only not littering um, or throwing trash out the car window. Uh, so we do formal education programs both on site and off site. So I have my own team of birds that I take um, to different programs. So we both do like school programs and community events. Um, right now for the summer we have a lot of camp programs. So camps come to us and we go to different camps. Uh, we bring um, our team of birds and we just we talk about them. We talk about how cool these guys are. We show their species off and we really connect the visitors um, or our education programs to the birds. Um, 
we just partnered with a local brewery. So I was able to bring one of my birds um, to a brewery and um, I just sat and chatted with people as they were enjoying a beer and learning about the conservation work that both the brewery and we do. So it's really cool to create those um, community partners that really support our cause. And it just helps us spread the word um, about raptor conservation. We're also doing something called defining moments, and that's really creating special encounters for every single visitor that um, comes on by to our center. We have a three four mile trail that people can walk and see about 40 different birds. And um, throughout the day, the trainers and the educators will take birds out of their um, homes and really show them off uh, to the visitors. As you can see, um, we have a couple of trainers taking one of our black vultures for a walk down the trail. And people get a really cool close up experience with our vultures. Uh, we love showing off vultures. Vultures get such a bad reputation, um, but they're so important and they're so cool. And doing things like this, people slow down when they see vultures on the side of the road eating roadkill. Um, people will, if it's safe, move um, roadkill into the ditch um, instead of just driving over it. And it's really, really cool to hear those stories of people who came five years ago and they're coming back now with their grandkids and hey, we do this now with them. And um, it's really um, encouraging to hear that people are taking what we say to heart. And creating those defining moments we've noticed really um, connect people to the birds and the environment. Uh, we also have camps, both summer and winter camps. Um, and we really give kids a hands-on experience with these raptors and these really cool animals um, in general. And unfortunately, we are not doing a bird show this year. Um, we are trying to limit huge groups of people. Um, so we've been doing more of those defining moments, but normally we have a bird show and we're very excited to um, show off the bird show. But this is one of my absolute favorite faces to see at the bird show because he is in true wonder and true awe of these birds. And he's gonna remember whatever he just saw for a very long time. And if that's the only connection he ever makes with a raptor, that feeling is gonna stick with him and he's gonna wanna do something um, later on in his life when he's a little bit older to be able to do something. Um, so uh, we'll go over some of the conservation topics um, that we um, talk about in all those different education programs. Uh, we'll talk about these as well during um, when people call into our rehab center um, asking about different birds that they either think are sick or injured. Um, and so our rehab staff has also been trained on how to create empathy with the people that call and really try to connect those people as well on an emotional level. Um, and so, yes, empathy is a huge word right now at our center um, because without empathy, people really don't care. So we gotta be able to connect with um, the public on some sort of emotional level, even if it's a little one. So littering is a huge, huge topic, especially with kids. Um, we do get, as you guys saw, a lot of raptors that are hit by cars. So if you guys notice, especially along highways, there is a lot of trash along the side of the road. Well, the trash attracts rodents and the rodents attract raptors. And so one of the biggest human wildlife conflicts is um, wildlife and car collisions. So raptors will be hunting up in a tree on one side of the road. They see a rodent running along the other. And as students, raptors find their prey, they zone in on that prey, and that's all that they focus on. And so um, when a car is coming, they're not necessarily around, aware of all their surroundings. And that's how these guys end up getting hit by cars. Um, so this great horned owl came in um, a handful of years ago. He's stuck in um, the grill of someone's car. Uh, again, lucky for him, we were able to pull him out. Um, he didn't have too many injuries. We were able to heal him up and he was able to be released. Um, not 
all raptors that get hit by cars are so lucky. Um, our education birds, a handful of them, did come through our rehab center, and um, some of our birds were also specifically raised for education. So we have birds from all over the world and the birds from different countries were raised at other zoos and raptor centers and it um, has been kind of shown that those birds tend to be more comfortable in human care compared to the wild raptors that come because they're used to being afraid of people and humans um, and so with um, birds that were hit by cars a lot of the ones that are um, our resident birds that were hit by cars, a good handful of them um, weren't able to be released because of wing injuries. So um, yes, a good way to prevent birds from getting hit by cars is simply keep your trash in your car until you find a proper trash can. Um, I kind of touched base on this a little bit before, but poisons is a big one. Um, this little guy, the screech owl, came in uh, very sluggish and very unaware of his surroundings and he um, had consumed a rat with rat poison. Well, not a rat, a mouse. He couldn't kill a rat. A rat is bigger than he is. Um, but he ate a mouse with rat poison. And when that happens, our bird, those birds become very, very sick. Um, we are able to um, get these guys functioning um, back to normal with lots of fluids and we kind of flush it out of their system. Um, but it does take a lot of time for them to regain their strength um, before they're able to be released again. So rodenticides, insecticides, herbicides, they all make their way up the food chain. So even if you spray um, your garden to protect it from insects, well, if a mouse eats an insect that has insecticides, um, that mouse now has insecticides in it. Then if an owl eats that mouse, that owl has insecticides in it. And if an owl out of five mice that an owl eats has different poisons in them, that does not stand for good odds for that owl um, surviving. So um, unfortunately, poisons are a really, really big one. And during our bird shows, that's kind of one we try to hit home with, um, with the parents who bring their kids to our bird shows. Um, instead of using poisons, we always try to give an alternative um, because we don't want people being all bummed out or to feel guilty. Um, the goal is never to make anybody feel guilty for something that they're doing. We just want people to be aware and um, change some of those habits. So instead of using poisons, uh, we recommend the good old fashioned snap traps. It is more humane than the glue traps like I talked about before. Um, and they're fairly um, cost effective as well or you can get an owl box and hang an owl box in your backyard. Owls are amazing nighttime hunters um, and they're always fun to watch or listen to um, in your very own backyard. So instead of poisons, snap traps or um, try to attract owls to your neighborhoods. Uh, so kidnapping, um, this is a big one, um, especially this time of year for any animal, not just raptors. Um, maybe many baby owls are kidnapped by well-intentioned humans. Um, again, we never want to make people feel guilty for trying to do the right thing. We just try to inform them next time, you know, this is actually a super healthy baby. Um, a lot of times with baby birds, you can just pick them up and put them back in the nest. Um, it is a myth that the mom and dad can smell the human on the babies. Birds have a terrible sense of smell. Um, a great horned owl's favorite snack is actually a skunk, so terrible sense of smell. Um, and raptor parents are amazing parents. They are taking very good care of their babies, um, and so a lot, of, a lot of times you can put them back in the nest. Or if a bird is fledgling, um, it takes a while to learn how to fly. Wings are complicated. You have to figure out how to get all the right movements in order to get off the ground. So a lot of times for a few days, baby birds spend a lot of time on their ground and the parents are still feeding them as the baby figures out how those pesky wings work. So um, just be aware of babies. A lot of times they're just fine. You just got to leave them alone. Um, if you are concerned, if you see a physical injury on that baby, then you can call a rehab center and they can talk you through what to do. 
But the majority of the time, for any baby animal, it's best just to leave them alone and keep your pets away from them. And that includes baby deer. Again, we're only raptors, but I have a lot of friends in the rehab community and um, baby deer are a big one. The mom leaves the baby during the day and then they always come back. And so kidnapping baby deer is a big one that can be prevented. Um, animal parents are good parents. Humans don't know how to teach baby animals how to do animal things. And so a lot of times if you end up taking the bird in, even if it's a songbird and you raise a baby songbird and release it, that songbird did not learn how to act like a songbird. It didn't learn how to find food like a songbird. It didn't know how to look for predators like a songbird should. Baby birds learn so much from their parents and it's super important for them to learn those skills in order to survive into the wild. Many of the birds that um, were helped by people and then released um, are actually not successful out in the wild because they didn't learn those things. So what we do at the Raptor Center to prevent that from happening is we either have foster parents, so we have our own um, specific raptors, like we have a great horned owl that takes care of all the great horned owl babies that come through. Um, and basically we toss in the food and she teaches them how to be owls. Um, and so she does a really good job with that. I'm pretty sure she had 17 babies this year that she, we kind of rotated through um, and they were all able to be released because they were showing signs that yes, they know um, what to do now. If we don't have a foster parent, um, we actually will relocate those babies into nests that we know were successful. So we know where a lot of raptor nests are in Mecklenburg County and we keep an eye on those nests for uh, when eggs hatch and we can put baby birds that were brought into us and were perfectly healthy into the same species nest as um, a lot of like raptors. So a lot of times barred owls, we can put an extra barred owl in barred, wild barred owl nests and they can take care of those babies and they have enough resources. We give them extra resources to be able to um, be successful raising an extra baby. Same with red-shouldered hawks and red-tailed hawks. We have an idea where different types of raptor nests are so they can be raised by the parents um, because that is ultimately the best um, chance of success that those babies have. Um, side note, I guess, because this is kind of interesting. Um, when raptors hatch, they don't necessarily know what's going on um, and they do something called imprinting. So when they're getting fed by their parents, they're imprinting on those parents. They're like, okay, you're feeding me. I must be what you are. I should start acting how you act. I should start communicating how you communicate. Um, and so when humans take babies away from that situation, raptors start imprinting on humans. So that means they associate food with humans. And instead of being afraid of humans, they walk up to humans. And if we were to release a bird like that, they would go to humans to find food, which is dangerous for both the humans and the bird because you don't want a wild raptor flying down at you looking for food. Kind of scary. So um, just be really aware with baby animals um, and that helps a lot of human wildlife conflict uh, that way. Um, around this time of year as well, we have been getting a lot of calls about overly protective raptor parents. Um, so if you have a raptor nest in your backyard, sometimes um, those parents do not like it when you enjoy your own backyard and they start dive bombing people in their own backyards. So we get angry calls about these raptors and can we just shoot them and can we just take down the nest and both of those options are illegal um, so we really try to talk about how cool it is that you get to see baby raptors grow up because it is cool and it only truly lasts um, a few months it only lasts four to five months and yes it is inconvenient we're not saying it's not um, but what you can do is you can set up an umbrella and you can sit under the umbrella. Raptors do not like umbrellas. Um, 
plus it's hot right now anyway, you probably want an umbrella for some shade and you just kind of um, uh, kind of ride out the wave there. Um, and so usually that tends to work when we explain, you know, I bet you don't have a whole lot of rodents in your yard because these raptors are doing such a good job with your rodent control. Um, and we talk about how important these guys are to the food web and not everybody gets to see this. And so when you kind of make it special and make it a big deal, people kind of change their minds. Um, some people are just cranky about it. And so um, what we tell them is, well, once everybody leaves the nest, um, you can take down the nest once everybody's out of there um, and you can try and make it a little less comfortable next time. So that means being more active in your backyards. If you do not want um, parents feeling comfortable enough to nest and raise young. So being active, raptors don't really like people. So if you're active in your backyard and you um, have a lot of movement going on, usually that prevents raptors from nesting too close to your um, house or in your backyard. Uh, so we get a lot of questions about pets as well. Um, the reason I have a vulture here is we have been getting a lot of calls specifically about vultures. And if the vultures are going to eat um, your dog or your cat, um, the answer is no. Uh, vultures only eat dead things. If you have a vulture nearby, um, there probably was a dead thing farther along and they're just digesting their meal or they're just looking for food. Um, and that's not going to be your dog or your cat. Just because they're big doesn't mean they're going to eat your dog or your cat. Um, and so a lot of times with the vultures, we just say, oh yeah, no, nope, they're just passing through um, and kind of leave it at that. Uh, we also talk about for people who there's this big hawk, is it going to eat my cat, my dog? Um, well, at Carolina Raptor Center, we are um, very um, against, well, I shouldn't say against, but if you're worried about your cat, you should just keep it inside. Um, it is best for the environment if you have your cats inside. Um, in 2020, in the U.S. alone, two billion birds were killed by cats. And so cats are not a natural part of the ecosystem and yet they kind of insert themselves in there. So if you're truly worried about your cat, keep it inside. I am a cat person. I love cats. Snuggling with my cat is one of my favorite pastimes. So I'm not trying to bash on cats in any way, um, but they do have a place and that is indoors. So if you're truly worried about your cat, just keep it inside. Um, that's where it's going to be safe um, and it's going to save um, a lot of different uh, wildlife as well. Um, if you're worried about a small dog, um, what we tell people is raptors can usually only carry about 30 to 50 percent of their body weight. So an ideal um, hunting technique for raptors is to grab something and carry it into a tree so they can eat in a tree safely. Um, rather than eat on the ground. If you eat on the ground, you're vulnerable to predators. Something else might try to steal your food like a coyote or a fox. So these guys really try to catch smaller things so they can carry it up into a tree. Plus, it is really hard to catch a small dog. They are fast. And so that's going to take a lot of energy for that raptor to catch um, a small dog. And that's not worth their energy. Um, and they would rather catch an easy meal. So um, a lot of times, I'm not saying it never happens because obviously it does, but a lot of times you normally don't have to worry about your raptors and your pets. Um, if you provide a, a good habitat for raptors where you um, can create a better food chain for them, um, like if you set up your own certified backyard habitat, um, that actually will also prevent um, raptors from going after small dogs um, out of necessity. So a couple different things to do. Generally, um, raptors leave your pets alone. If you're extra concerned, just take your dog out and go out with it. Um, raptors don't like people. So as long as you're with your dog, it will be just fine. Um, so lead poisoning right now is a big um, conflict issue. 
All of the Eagles that have come in through our rehab center in 2021 have had lead in their system. Um, and so Eagles can get lead poisoning in a couple different ways. Um, a lot of vultures that come in also have lead poisoning. So Eagles and vultures can get it from a deer that was hit by a car. Um, if it was shot earlier in its life and it just was a wound and it got away from the hunter, um, the lead fragments from the bullet are still in that deer and still in their system. So if a bird eats that, that gets into the bird system um, and that can cause a lot of damage. Um, eagles also get it from eating uh, fish. If the fish has any sort of lead sinker or lead tackle in it, um, that can cause lead poisoning in the eagle as well. Now, I believe um, lead tackle is kind of out to date and not a lot of people use it. And I wanna say it's illegal to use in the water system, but I could be incorrect there. Um, but if lead that's been used um, however long ago um, is at the bottom of the lake or the river and a bottom uh, feeder fish eats it, then, then the eagle eats that fish. Lead doesn't leave the system. It's still in that waterway and it still can pop up in different places. Um, and a lot of our eagles tend to find it. So unfortunately, lead poisoning is a big issue for our raptors right now. And one of the things that uh, we suggest doing is switching over to copper ammunition. And um, that has been a long discussion um, throughout the United States for a couple of years now about switching over to copper. And um, that's a whole debate and PowerPoint in itself. So I don't want to get into that one too much, um, but we really try and encourage um, hunters to switch over to copper ammunition. Um, entanglement, uh, when you first glance at this picture, it looks a little bit weird, um, but if you notice over um, in like the left-hand corner in the branches, uh, there's fishing line. And this poor barred owl managed to find a fishing line that was strong in between branches in a tree. Uh, we were able um, to get it down and it was able to be released. Um, but it did have a small wing fracture that we had to heal up before it could be released. So um, again, like I mentioned earlier, balloon strings tend to be one that birds get caught up in and reel in your fishing line. If you do get it caught in a tree like this, I know it's hard and it's inconvenient, um, but trying to get as much of it as possible out of this ecosystem um, would be vital for some of these birds. Um, I know balloons are fun and whimsical and for birthday parties and weddings, they add that whimsical fun element. Um, and so some of the alternatives to that that we suggest are bubbles. I love bubbles. Um, I think they're fun, they're interactive. You can get big bubbles, little bubbles, all sorts of different types of bubbles. Um, we also, suggests there's a lot of really cool um, paper decorations that can be made into 3D objects and shapes. And so there's a lot of really cool things that you can do um, instead of balloons, and you can save a lot of wildlife as well. Not only do wildlife get caught up in strings, but the plastic in the balloons, um, a lot of animals end up digesting and they can't pass it through, so it gets stuck in their stomachs and that ends up killing them as well. So. Um, lots of alternatives to balloons, um, something to keep in mind. Again, not trying to make people feel guilty for using balloons because everybody uses balloons. Um, but next time you throw a birthday party, um, just kind of take a look at some of the other fun decoration items um, that are out there. All right, so oh, that was almost 45 minutes exactly. I. Um, that's exciting. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast. Uh, we do have time to answer questions. I'll put my face back on the screen here just to make sure um, that um, I'm more personable this way too and I'm not just a floating voice. So yes, and if you need me to go back to a slide, I am more than happy to go back to a slide as well. Um, I realized I did go kind of fast too um, as I was going through. Well, thank you so much, McKenna. Uh, this is
Fantastic presentation. Um, we do have some questions in the chat. If anyone has any questions, um, you can do the raise your hand function or you can just write them directly in the chat. Um, so John Howard asked, he asked, what are the penalties for shooting a hawk that's predating chickens? Um, he says that he's told friends who raise chickens that killing hawks is illegal, but some don't seem to pay any attention to that. Yes, so um, whenever we get a um, bird that comes in with a wing injury, uh, we do report it. Um, legally, we have to, but obviously we want to. And we give the specific location where the bird was found. Um, it's usually a fine. Um, I'm not sure if anybody does get like jail time or anything, but they do get fined heavily um, for shooting raptors if they're caught. Awesome. Um, and then Donna asked, are the birds still at the original site or have they been moved to the trail at Quest? Oh, good question. Um, that I'm glad that some people know what we are. So Quest is our new building that we're teaming up with Parks and Rec and we wanna create a whole environmental experience. Um, the building itself at Quest is completed. Um, I think we're hoping to open that in July. Um, but our side of things, um, unfortunately with COVID, uh, we do not have the budget right now. We're still working on raising money for the brand new enclosures for our birds. So we're a ways away yet for moving those birds. We're still at our original site. Um, we have some really cool new birds at our facility um, that we're really excited about. And so, um, Yes, it's definitely worth coming down. Even though we're not at Quest yet, we got some really cool birds that we're so excited to show off. Um, and so, yes, unfortunately not at Quest yet. Sorry, that was a long story short. Not at Quest yet. We don't really have a timeline right now. We're still working on the funding. Awesome, that is really cool. Um, and then Stephen Genkins asked, uh, do raptor parents always accept extra babies that you place in their nests? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so again, these are um, raptor parents that we've observed for the last like couple of years to make sure one, that they're successful. We don't wanna put extra babies in with parents that weren't successful the year before. Um, but when we do that, we do give them extra mice as we kind of like place a bird and then we like pay like, here's some, a handful of mice to help them out. And then we do check on um, those nests uh, throughout the spring to make sure that all the babies are growing. Um, and if need be, we do, again, provide extra mice. But for the majority of the time, the parents are just fine um, accepting that extra baby. Awesome. Um, and along the question of uh, the, the fosters and, and the babies being introduced into the nests, um, will raptors foster a baby of another species, uh, like a great horned owl fostering a barred owl? Donna, Donna wants to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we don't do that. I'm not sure, like, naturally if they would or not. Um, but since those species are different, um, like they have different behaviors, like that are subtle to like, so I study animal behavior, and so like um, barred owl behavior and great, great horned owl behavior is very different. And so we wouldn't want a baby barred owl to learn great horned owl um, behaviors because they wouldn't be successful out in the wild. Um, so we don't do that. I don't know like naturally if out in the wild they would do that. Um, I know that there's always pictures and videos floating around of like um, raptors like raising like a baby duck or something. Um, those are all usually like staged. Um, that's not actually a real thing. Um, they don't have, yes, like that's food. Like I just remember seeing one of those videos and I'm like, that was totally staged. Um, so yeah, so we don't do that. Um, again, just behaviorally, uh, we don't think that would actually work out for anybody. Excellent. Um, and then Marion 
Carrick. I am going to apologize ahead of time if I just butchered that. Um, but they just want to be clear. What exactly defines a bird as a raptor? Um, Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have explained that at the beginning. So that's what I do for all of my education programs. Um, so the original um, definition was, or like the traditional definition is they have to have those talons, that hooked beak, and they have to rub really good eyesight. But if you look into it a little bit deeper, owls don't have that great of eyesight. So does that not make them a raptor? Vultures do not have strong feet because they eat stuff that's already dead. So they don't have to kill anything. So they have really weak feet. So does that not make them a raptor? Um, and for conservation purposes, um, in order to get funding, um, you have to be really specific with wording and grant work and stuff like that. And some facilities were not getting funding um, for owl conservation or vulture conservation because the people giving the money are like, oh, those technically aren't raptors. And you're like, well, according to my definition, they are. So um, the Peregrine Fund and a whole slew of ornithologists um, recently came up with kind of a new definition to encompass everybody um, and make sure that like we have a whole universal definition. Um, so the new definition that we're going with um, that we think really works out well is um, raptors eat uh, vertebrates, they eat other animals, so they're carnivores, they only eat meat. Uh, raptors are land dwelling birds, so that kind of like gets away the penguins, right? Penguins hunt in the ocean, they're very much water birds, so um, that kind of gets rid of albatross and waterfowl and stuff like that that eat meat. Um, and then the last thing is they all come from the same ancestor, which is a terror bird, uh, which is a dinosaur. Um, so kids love that definition because I always get asked like, oh, do you work with dinosaurs? So the new um, definition encompasses hawks, eagles, owls, falcons, vultures, osprey, harriers, kites, and Sariamas. I want to say there's another one, but those are like the four main groups. Osprey live on the land. They just hunt with their feet in the water. They do not dive into the water and swim and spend most of their day in the water. They spend most of their day on the land. So that's why Osprey are considered a raptor. Yep. Awesome. Um... And there's there's no more questions in the chat, but I have a quick question. Yes. Um, from your oh, I'll hold off on my question. Uh, it looks like Vic Vicky Matlock has a question, so you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute, Vicky, if you're if you have the question. Uh, I'm a volunteer for the Raptor Center, and uh, we're always looking for more volunteer transporters. So if anybody on here is interested, please get with McKenna or anyone up at the Raptor Center for more information. So, sorry for the dog. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to answer the one question, the federal uh, fine uh, for killing a Raptor is $5,000. To whoever oh, yes. Thank you. to know about that. That's it. Yes. Thank you, Vicki. Yes, no, I truly, we would be not where we are today if it weren't for a lot of our volunteers. Um, the transport, the ones who work in the rehab center, um, the ones that work on my end of things where it's more of the resident bird care. Um, we have docents that are out on the trail connecting visitors to our birds. Um, Carolina Raptor Center truly, yeah, like we depend on our volunteers and we appreciate everything that they all do. So I'm glad that, yeah, we got to have one um, hop on here. That's pretty awesome. Okay, and uh, I'll just go ahead and ask my question then. Um, out of your presentation today, McKenna, mm -hmm. what is the highlight of things people can do at home? Like just like a, a little bulleted, just like a little highlight of a great takeaway of what they can do at home to help wildlife and, and help raptors. Yeah, that's yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so a lot of what um, a big issue 
in Charlotte is right now. Um, and I mean, throughout North Carolina too, because North Carolina is a great state, but um, the human population is growing. And so bigger cities are expanding out and out and out. And even smaller cities are starting to become bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so a lot of wildlife is losing their original habitat and their original homes. Um, and so something that humans can do is create that certified backyard habitat. Um, you can plant those natural plants in your backyards, um, keep your old tall trees, um, if it's safe, obviously, like safety does come first and I'm totally, totally understand that. But if you can like keep those old growth trees, um, create habitat for those little prey items, um, and then those can encourage the raptors to have in your backyards. Um, raptors are a lot of fun um, to watch and hunt. I myself have bird feeders and I have a Cooper's hawk that comes two to three times a week and he tries to steal one of my morning doves. And it's really cool to watch his flights and appreciate the circle of life. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's just one thing that people can do as the human population grows is just trying to provide all sorts of wildlife um, habitat that we've been taking away. Awesome. And it looks like Donna included, and sorry, there's thunder and lightning going on behind me, so I hope that's not being included in my audio here. Um, it looks like Charlotte Wildlife Stewards uh, can help advise on creating a wildlife habitat. I uh, that. According to Donna, I will also say that NCWF has a certified wildlife habitat program as well. Um, so if anyone has any questions, links for Charlotte Wildlife is in the chat and so is NCWF. So take full advantage of these organizations for certified wildlife habitat. Um, and thank you so much for speaking today, McKenna. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, if anyone has any future questions, would they be able to contact you or anything like that? Did that not come through? Um, I just heard, yes, thank you so much. Ask the questions. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, okay, awesome. Yeah, if they, if anyone has any questions for you, where would they be able to contact you? Oh, gotcha. Um, you can either, yeah, contact my email, um, which is in the PowerPoint, um, but it's mschafer at carolinaraptorcenter.com. Org. Um, you can look at our website. It's in the staff directory. Um, if you guys have any questions about any birds that you're like, should I take this to our rehab center? Should I not? Um, or if you have any questions about different bird behavior, like, hey, this bird did something cool. Like, what was it doing? Feel free to call us. Um, we a lot of our um, time is spent talking to the public, either me on the education side or rehab talking um, to the public about the things that they see in their backyard. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, we do, we want to teach, we want people to learn, we want people um, to grow with wildlife. So uh, feel free yeah, to reach out at any time. Awesome, well, thank you so much, McKenna. Uh, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful night and I'm um, gonna you know, hopefully this rain is gonna be good for Eastern NC, but uh, have a wonderful night, okay? Bye-bye.